Well, good evening, everybody. Um, we are massively oversubscribed this evening, um, but I know that there will be people um, who will not be able to attend the live session and um, are going to be watching the recording. So I, I'm pretty certain that everyone who's signed up for the event and wants to attend live will be able to get into the room. Uh, my name is Dudley Giles. Um, I operate on Twitter under the handle of Battle Guide, uh, and with me this evening is Rich Fisher, uh, and I'm going to let Rich introduce himself. Hi, evening all. Uh, so, yeah, Rich Fisher, and I'm Vickers MG on pretty much most social media platforms, unless uh, unless somebody's got there first. But, yeah, e quite easy to find anyway. Um. So how this platform works, and it might be, I know that there are some people in the audience that um, have been on Demio before and know how it works. It's not like Zoom. So when you come into the room, you are automatically, your camera and your audio feed are muted, but you can communicate with us through the chat box. And, and I can see that you're doing that already, which is great. Um, it also works through your browser, and it works best on the Chrome browser. Uh, other browsers are available, and it will work with Microsoft Edge, um, uh, with Firefox, uh, and with Safari. Um, but if you are having any issues this evening with your connection, then there are a number of IA drills that you can employ. And I will remind you about that in the chat box um, as we go along. Um, the first IA drill, immediate action drill, for those that weren't in the army, um, is to refresh the browser. And for those that don't know what refresh the browser means, there's that funny little circle on the top left of your browser with an arrow on it. If you click on that, it will refresh the page. That generally sorts out any problems that you might have. If that doesn't work, then use the IT crowd solution which is to close the browser down and then open it again with the same link that you used to get, join us this evening. Uh, that also works very well. And if you are still having problems, and one or two of you might, uh, because of the strength of your uh, bandwidth, then you can always try using a different browser. Once again, closing down this browser, putting in the link and trying again. Um, Experience has shown me that 90% of people have no difficulty whatsoever, but there are 10% or so that because of the quality of their internet connection at home, may be having problems with video and audio. And those are the ways that you can um, sort that out. If you do have a problem and you, and you have to leave, everybody who has signed up this evening will get a copy of the recording so you won't miss anything. And uh, one of the reasons why I've been talking uh, about nothing in particular at the moment is because Demio uh, spreads the, the love around and is trying to work out how many people are in the room before it settles down and gives you an equal share of the bandwidth. And so it's a bit like opening the doors to a, the auditorium and then you're all coming in. And so far, um, we have 160 people who have signed up for this evening's session. And I can see 83 people already in the room. And I'm just giving time for a few more people to join us before we go to um, the recording. Um, one last thing. Please, if a question occurs to you this evening, ask it in the chat box as it occurs to you. Uh, and Rich will try to answer it during the recording if he can, or otherwise we will save it up for the um, Q&A session, which will follow straight on from the recording. So for me, this is a bit of a first. This is the first time I've tried to do what is called a hybrid session. That's where we've gone live. I'm then going to play a, a video recording that uh, Rich and I recorded a few days ago, and some of you would have seen trailers on Twitter. And can I please tell you, it's not like going to the cinema when you go and see the trailers and you've, you've seen all the best bits. Uh, <laughs> there are best bits to come. They're not all in those Twitter feeds. Um, 
but we will play that uh, that video and then um, we will close down the video and go into a live Q&A. Um, I don't want this to go on for um, longer than an hour for most people. Um, so when we get to the top of the hour, um, those that want to go, feel free to go, please. But we will stay on to answer the last questions. That's OK, Rich, isn't it? Yeah, that's uh, fine. Yeah. Um, and there is bonus content to show at the end. Um, there is um, Rich is going to take us around the Vickers gun and demonstrate how it operates. Um, and also for those that really want to know how to strip and assemble a Vickers machine gun, he's going to show us that as well. Um, so welcome to everybody who's in the room. Um, 85, I think that's probably the most. So um, Stephen's saying he has no picture or sound yet. So once again, use the IA drill. I'll just put it in here. No sound. So what, while Dudley's doing that, perhaps um, I'll just share that we've put together a quick poll as well so some of you will, will well hopefully you'll all be aware um of why we we've come together this week it's very much um thanks to Dudley to reaching out to me on Twitter to saying that he wanted to help out and promote the book that the Vickers MG Collection and Research Association is reprinting so um you know there's there's more sort of to come on that uh but the we've put together a quick poll and just to give us an idea really of how effective uh, this medium is for promoting that uh, and also to try and work out how much I witter on about it perhaps at the end so uh, if you if you can go and answer that um, it, Dudley's just shared it there uh, just just let us know whether you've ordered it already if everybody says they've ordered it then perhaps I won't mention it again or perhaps I'll test you um, yeah it'd be re really really great to understand how, how, how we're going with that because that's you know clearly uh, a big project for us at the moment Okay, so whilst that's running, and you can all see it, the answers coming in, um, just to let you know, we've got people from the USA, from Canada, France, Belgium, Italy, Australia, Japan, and even Andrew Webb, who's out in Georgia, and that's not Georgia, USA, by the way, that's Georgia, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, which used to be part of Russia, uh, or Soviet Union, rather, um, he signed up for it as well. Okay, um, 56 answers there. Um, so you've got 35 people you've got to convince this evening um, in the audience. Uh, Rich, are you there? Yeah. This is why we this is why we recorded the session because Rich is just frozen and um, he'll need to reboot himself in a second. So whilst he's um, doing that, I'm going to um, run the video. Um, contact him uh, by email and tell him to get back on, on net. Um, and um, we'll see you on the other side of the video. Okay, Rich, so wh why don't we start with uh, you telling us something about yourself and then trying to explain to us why you're so fascinated with a weapon system which I know it was in operation right up into the 1980s in some parts of the world, but frankly it was designed over 100 years ago. So uh, it all stems from about 25 years ago now. My grandfather was a Vickers machine gunner in the Second World War, and I was sort of interested in military history stuff. I'd been given some uh, medals from, the, from one of the houses that we were clearing out from the family. So we went to some D-Day commemorations in 1994, um, so perhaps a little bit more than 25 years ago is when it really starts. But we went to the Royal Marines Museum in South Sea, and Pa he he, he hadn't sort of really he talked a bit about his time uh, in Italy in in the Second World War, and he served at Anzio. Um, but we sat he sat down behind a Vickers machine gun and can, took it apart. So I was absolutely mesmerised by the fact that he could remember, like, 50 years on, taking apart this Vickers machine gun. He obviously he then just talked about it. Um, thankfully, he could put it back together. I think the security staff, uh, the museum staff, were a little bit uh, concerned that he wouldn't be able to. But he did. He then talked about it all the way home. And thankfully, 
uh, well, thankfully, I was 12 or 13 at the time. Um, thankfully, is sort of uh, one of those subjective words my parents might choose to use or not. But I had the opportunity to buy one only a few months later. So I bought a Vickers machine gun then, uh, age 12, and it was it, it's been a, a hobby that has you know fascinated me ever since. You know, the Vickers taps into so many people's experiences of um of the great war the second world war uh, and beyond it's just you know really kept me interested ever since then and you've set up this association so can you explain to us a bit about what it does uh, and who it involves yeah so uh 10 years ago now i decided that the collection had become quite expansive uh and anybody that's visiting will see that uh and that's what was happening people were becoming more interested in what i had here uh some of the rarer pieces or just some of the some of the fact that it's not just about the guns it's about all the accessories it's about the information the manuals the pamphlets the paraphernalia the stories and everything that goes around it so different organizations groups individuals were saying can we come and see it and that made me realize, that, okay, perhaps this is, you know, not wishing to sound magnanimous about it, but this is bigger than me. And so I decided to, to, to form the Vickers MG Collection and Research Association, which is a not-for-profit company. And that now owns the collection that, that I formed uh, between the mid-90s and 2011. And the collection has gradually, over the last 10 years, become more and more self-sustainable. So it's less reliant on me, uh, which is you know, uh, a, a huge burden off, off of my mind, actually. Uh, but it also means that it's much more accessible to other people as well. So we've got a board of directors that act as trustees for the for the association. Uh, and we, we then have a group of members that help advise us. So uh, th those members are made up of people from the Machine Gun Corps History Project that we're working with, and we'll talk more about. They're made up of uh, reenactors and living historians that we work with. So, yeah, we'll go out and do displays. Uh, we'll support documentary making. Uh, we'll, you know, there's volunteers that come and help uh, do the you know, cleaning of this stuff, sorting spare parts, cataloging, archiving, digitization, all of those things that we're trying to make sure that the, um, uh, our object is to educate and inform the public about the use of the Vickers machine gun and the people that used it. So, you know, hopefully that's what the association does. Uh, you know, it, the Vickers machine gun was the medium machine gun of the British Army from 1912 to 1968. You know, an absolutely sort of a really wide period uh, that people, there's lots of, lots of information to get your head round. One of the things that we are you know, building more and more is that online content. Uh, amazingly, we've been on online uh, since the late 90s, partly because I was a teenager that learned how to write a website. So that's what I wrote a website about. And it was uh, putting more and more digital material, manuals, pamphlets, and information online, uh, building a community on there as well. And we did loads of YouTube videos too. So a lot of that is trying to get the information that I've learned over the last 25 years out of my head and in, in wider knowledge. So we did publishing and writing books and things as well. You mentioned in that, um, you talked about a medium machine gun. And of course, there's a lot of terminology around about machine guns. You've got light, medium, heavy. Uh, you've got general uh, purpose machine guns, etc. Could you, for the uninformed, um, which is probably many people watching this in terms of technology, uh, what are the distinctions between all those terms that I've just reeled off? When the Vickers first entered service, and this is a 1914 example, one of the earliest we've got in the collection, it's actually just the machine gun. Uh, because it's alongside the Maxim. Uh, and when Vickers are originally proposing it to the War Office, it's actually the light gun, because it's a fair few pounds lighter than the Maxim. Um, but by the mid-1920s, we've had the Lewis gun introduced, uh, which is then becomes the light machine gun uh, that people would then see replaced by the Bren light machine gun as well. The Vickers becomes the medium machine gun. So a medium machine gun is something that's normally tripod mounted and is capable of sustained fire, which is what the water jacket um, you know, ena enables the Vickers to be doing here. Uh, you then have heavy machine guns as well, which are typically... Um, 
often very visually similar, uh, but they actually have, fire a lot heavier ammunition. So the 0.5 inch ammunition, 12.7 mil and above, and it's designed for anti anti armor and anti aircraft. So although this is a heavy machine gun, only by weight, not by name. Um, you know, it, it is heavy. Uh, it is quite the weight, a uh, hundred pounds or so, uh, for, with as it sits there. Uh, but it's not a heavy machine gun itself. Those that are familiar with modern service weapons um, would be familiar with the Browning 0.5 inch or 50 cal, which is the uh, the heavy machine gun. Vickers did produce a heavy machine gun variant in 0.5 inch, which is very much a scaled up version. Uh, and they put that in light tanks at the start of the Second World War. Uh, but this this is what you know, goes from, bizarrely, goes from being the light gun to just the machine gun and then to the medium machine gun. What you have alongside all that in the 1930s uh, is the Germans introducing the universal machine gun, which is their MG34, and then turns into the MG42. And that takes the role of the light machine gun as a section weapon, or it's bipod mounted, could be fired by one man, supported by one other perhaps, but generally you know, a low number of men. And then it combines that with what they call the Schwer um, machine gun So they're heavy machine gun. They don't have a medium machine gun role, but it does the same job as what the British were calling the medium machine gun. And that's what they're referring to as the universal machine gun. We take that concept at the end of the uh, Second World War and, you know, and on into the 50s, and we eventually adopt the FN mag as the general purpose machine gun, the general, the L7, uh, you know, and that's still what's in service today uh, as the general purpose machine gun. The Americans have it as the M240. Uh, but it, it combines those roles of light and medium machine gun. And with any combination, it compromises as well, actually. So the sustained fire element that you get with water cooling is perhaps lost a little bit by just having the air-cooled barrel on a tripod. But it still is able to do the indirect fire and uh, the overhead fire and things that you know, the Vickers was able to do. So, so what made the Vickers machine gun so special? The, the, its ability to sustain fire. So the fact that it's a water-cooled machine gun, it, you know, th this barrel casing holds seven pints of water. That boils up after about a thousand rounds. But as long as you can keep supplying that with water and ammunition, and that will keep firing. You know, the, it, it, spare parts, nothing's going to break on this gun that can't be replaced by the machine gun detachment, by the section, or the spare parts that are carried. So the, the water-cooled machine gun element of a medium machine gun means that it can sustain fire a lot longer than an air-cooled weapon. Uh, because an air-cooled weapon, you keep having to change barrels. Uh, you know, eventually, the, the rest of that gun, the heat will dissipate, and it will warm up um, throughout. So you, that's clearly something that the British Army decides that it doesn't need from the 1960s onwards. Uh, you know, so it, it's not, the reason the Vickers gets replaced is not because it's old and out of date, it's because the army decides that it wants a different kind of battle, it wants a different set of doctrine around how it uses machine guns so it can have a different technology. Um, you know, which is why you see some of this overlap between the general purpose machine gun and the Vickers for a short period. Okay, so yeah, we've talked about the weapon um, let's talk a bit more about the machine gun core, because I think most Great War enthusiasts are aware that when we start out in 1914, um, we have two machine guns in, a in an infantry battalion. Um, and then all of a sudden, we seem to expand this capability such that we're, we're creating a new, a new arm, a new service. So can you tell us something about that? Yeah, so as you said, you start the Great War with two machine guns per battalion, a machine gun section attached to the battalion headquarters. And quickly in 1915, we realised that there's a need for additional automatic firepower. So we up, we up that. We, we put it up to four um, machine guns per section. And at the moment, I'm sort of I'm looking at how that happened and what the implications were, because you need more machine guns, you need more limbered wagons, you need more pack saddlery, you need more trained people as well. And eventually, over 1915, we're realising that we can do some quite specialist things with these machine guns. You know, we can do overhead, indirect fire. Uh, more and more accessories are being developed so that they can be used in different ways. Uh, so uh, hyperscopes, so you can fire them over the parapet and things like that. Um, you know, without, without the men being exposed, you can fire them further back uh, as our range type, range finding equipment becomes more specialist angular sight instruments that are more uh 
commonly seen with the artillery are being brought into into machine gunnery use and what starts to happen in in some of the battles of 1915 uh the earliest one that i've read about recently is nerf chapelle you see the brigade machine gun officer so that's normally uh like the senior machine gun officer of one of the three battalions one of the four battalions uh would step forward and you know go on the course uh at the machine gun school which had been set up at whisk you know, quite early on in the war they'd be going on that course and they come back to the brigade and you'd start to see the machine guns being brought together so you have the use of 16 machine guns all in one go and once you start putting that together you it, you can do some great things with it you can do these machine gun um barrages flanking fire and things like that not quite to the extent that we'll see later in the war but what it does mean then is that you've got this body of men all under the same um you know field command arrangement under the brigade machine gun officer but their administration their training is still very much down to the infantry battalions and the commanding officer of the battalions so they you know that there, there, there's some key characters that over 1950 are lobbying for a specialist corps to be made and eventually by october 1915 this corps the machine gun corps is formed and those brigade machine gun companies will eventually become part of the machine gun corps and its officers and, uh, and the men will be transferred and the officers will be seconded to the corps so it forms as a a, a way of centralizing command control logistics um, and development as well so it develops its own training center back in the uk at grantham uh, it starts to have its own you know it starts to run the machine gun school that's by which time at camier in france uh, they can just have the standardization of training and tactics that's necessary for what is a a, a growing arm of service uh, whether the machine gun corps existed as the cat badge that owned it or not this was happening and they needed to to fully understand and fully exploit the capability um, as a battlefield guide, um, I know that uh, I've taken clients on tour uh, and I've discussed the use of machine guns uh, at Mons, for instance. We all know what happened uh, at the bridge at Nimi. Um, I've also um, talked about the machine guns at Nairi. Um, but to be quite honest with you, I don't think I've really talked about the employment of machine guns uh, later in the war, which of course is where it becomes more interesting. So, um, as a guide, where's the best place for me to take a client who's interested in machine guns on the Western Front to, to show some of the things that you've been talking about? I think you, you can take them anywhere, really. Um, and, and one of the things that we, we're going to do is develop some, um, some sort of specialist information about machine gun use at different areas and different battles, particularly those key locations you talk about. It's something we're trying to be share, uh, we're sharing on Twitter and Facebook, uh, over the year anyway. But the peak of machine gunnery, the, the absolute peak is these, you know, multi gun barrages that are forming part of the wider barrage plans for, you know, a corps. And that truly comes at home at Vimy and the Canadian machine gun course. We've just got to step a little bit outside of our traditional sort of British focused boundaries um, and look at the Canadians and what they do. And at Vimy, they concentrate, I think it's 328 Vickers machine guns for, as part of a single fire plan. So the Canadian Corps has, uh, I can't quite remember the number of um, the number of machine gun companies that they've got. I think it's 16 Canadian machine gun companies and then four British that are, are, are part of the um, part of that action as well, plus their motor machine gun brigades, because one of the things that the machine gun corps um, develops is the infantry, the cavalry arm, the motors arm that many people might be f familiar with, because uh, it would eventually form some of the earliest men for the heavy branch, which would then form the tank corps. Yeah, outside of my, my, my sort of scope of interest after they stopped using the Vickers in the Mark II tanks. But the, you know, the, the motors can be driven up and support the infantry guns as well. So they put three 328 guns all along the same arrangement and that mixes so that isn't just everybody firing overhead and not seeing the enemy that mixes forward guns so those that are going for those that are being moved forward to consolidate gains um, mobile guns those that actually f f providing direct fire support for the infantry companies as they're moving forward and then rear guns those that are doing that overhead fire 
And to understand the scale of that, the the logistics that um, the Canadian MRG's book talks about is that they consolidate five, nearly five million rounds of 303 for that action, just for the machine gun companies, uh, so that they can keep this sustained fire up. And you know, so, so Vimy is it's not just a, a tale of exploits of machine gunnery, but the logistics that has to support it, the training that has to go into it as well. You know, the, the planning, this is, I, I think what that really tells and why I say it's the peak is because it's no longer two Maxims on a bridge um, being, come up, being fired by the senior NCO and, uh, and the machine gun officer in defense of uh, an attacking enemy. Um, you know, this is, you know, that, that's out of emergency. Vimy is very much planned to the letter um, with mass machine gunnery. Yeah, I, I, I've always been impressed by how quickly those tactics were developed and exploited on the battlefield. Um, which leads me on to the next question, I suppose, is why, therefore, did we then disband this machine gun corps in the early 1920s? I think it's quite simple that we're no longer fighting divisional level battles. And the machine gun corps is a divisional level asset uh, by that point. So, you know, with the formation of the companies, we've, that means that we've got three companies, three machine gun companies in the division. We then add a fourth as a divisional reserve machine gun company in 1917. And those were all consolidated into machine gun battalions in early 1918. Uh, very around the time of the Kaiserslag. So there's a lot of reorganization going on as well as, you know, an attacking enemy um, to, to upset things. But, you know, we suddenly make machine gun battalions a divisional level asset. And after the Second World War, with the move to small wars, not great wars, we see the rundown of the army as a whole. And in which case, you are no longer needing massed machine guns. Uh, you no longer, t if you don't need mass machine guns, you don't need all of the tactics and techniques that we developed for mass machine guns, which means you don't need the training centers and the single source of supply for men, which means you can actually go back to effective ranges being 2,000 yards, direct fire mainly, sometimes indirect at night and when obscured by smoke, etc. Uh, so you can revert them back to battalion level assets. What's quite interesting though is we disband the machine gun corps, all the machine guns go back to um, you know, a battalion level, they, they start to do so by as a platoon, so um, you know, just four guns, then that goes up to eight. And actually in the ni early 1930s, we're back to 16 Vickers machine guns in every infantry battalion. So we did have it in every infantry brigade, but we actually end up with 16 in every infantry battalion as like D company, which is really interesting. You know, we've got mass machine gunnery. So they've learned things again, that by the time we hit the second world war, we decide not to form a machine gun corps, but we're going to convert infantry regiments. So I mentioned my grandfather was in the Cheshire Regiment. That was one of the five eventual um, infantry regiments that, be kept, that provided machine gun battalions. So Cheshire's, Manchester's, Middlesex, Royal Thumb and Fusiliers and Kensington's. There were a couple of others as well. The Argyles and the Gordons provided the odd battalion for the Scottish divisions that didn't want to have um, a British, uh, British battalion with them. But it does mean that, you know, we, we, in a way, reform the MGC, uh, just without the cap badge. <coughs> Excuse me, let's move away um, from the, the, the machine gun and the core for the moment. And let's talk about this book, because that's what really prompted uh, me getting in contact with you in the first place. So, so what's special about this book, uh, which was, I think, published in 1919, and you claim to be one of the earliest uh, regimental or battalion uh, diaries. I, I claim it probably out of ignorance um, because I'm not sure of any others. Uh, you know, you've got Irish Guard stuff, um, you know, being published during the war, uh, but the, it's certainly you know uh, uh, um, the only machine gun corps uh, battalion history. So it's the 33rd battalion. Um, you know, history of the 33rd Battalion being also a history of the uh, the 19th, 98th and 100th Machine Gun Companies uh, and the 249th, they were the fourth that were added in there. So it goes back to covering like their formation in 1916, late 1516, a little bit of a prelude in there as well, all the way through to the end of the war with them in Germany in 1919. And... You know, so, so it's written like right up. It's one of these great battalion histories that's written before everybody disappears. It's before everybody goes home. Um, 
and I, it must be one of the earliest. So if you know, if watchers do know of any earlier ones, then you know, please shoot me down. Um, but it, it, it's one of those that I, I'm pretty sure is certainly one of the earliest, if not the earliest, unit history. Um, and, and it is so specific. You know, it's just about the 33rd Battalion. And as it, there are no other machine gun corps history, so it's got to represent all of those units of infantry on the Western Front. It's got to represent all of those units of the machine gun corps around the world, Mesopotamia, East Africa, all of those other companies uh, th that existed. Uh, it's also got to represent the cavalry units. Um, and perhaps that's where you know, it falls down a little bit, my argument, because there is the 20th Squadron Cavalry um, history as well, which is a very sort of slim affair. Um, but it, so it doesn't have to quite do all of the cavalry. Uh, the motors in there as well. It's got to represent so much. And it's put together by the men in 1919. Um, it's written by, uh, you know, say it, it's authored by the officers and men, that's the, the official them. But the, uh, I, I'm pretty sure uh, it was pulled together by their commanding officer. Um, he writes the end plates for it. He also does the, most of the um, m most of the watercolours that are in it as well. So it's beautifully illustrated throughout. And we, we decided that it, it was a limited edition uh, when originally published in 1919. There are a remarkable number of editions out there, though, because it was clearly a keepsake. Um, so 1600 published. I'm just estimating from what people have said, you know, a good third, maybe a half of those still exist because it's something that people were keeping on their shelves. Um, by the fact that it's got these beautiful watercolours in it, it gives a, you know, it also has a huge number of photos, perhaps, that we're now very familiar with as well. So, you know, you know this is published before the Imperial War Museum start to, um, you know, provide photos for publication. But it's some that have clearly ended up in the IWM archives as well. Um, you know, it, it, it's just a great sort of tale. Uh, Hutchison is the commanding officer that, that I talk about, you know, there, there are some bits that are clearly his work and uh, we know that because it's the same writing style he goes on to write uh, machine guns their tactical history and oh, their history and their tactical employment in 1938 he, he, he he's quite a prolific author he writes his own autobiographies um, and he's still writing in 1945 uh, you know really sort of close to the end of the second world war and close to close to his death as well um, it's it includes all the formation of the companies, how they change into the battalions, and because they were part of 33rd Division, uh, you know, it's got some of those sort of key actions that perhaps people are very familiar with. You know, they were a division that fought at the Somme, uh, so it talks about High Wood, and it perhaps as well is where the most famous, um, infamous, I will call it, story of machine gunnery in the First World War uh, comes from uh, in the million rounds being fired at High Wood. And one of the things that we've done is started to not just do a simple reprint of this. A project that I started many years ago, actually, was to transcribe this purely for my own purposes, because uh, for those that are aware of, uh, of the website, you know, we digitize all of our manuals, all of our archive, and it's there freely available and downloadable for people to read. That's a byproduct of the reason we did that. The reason we did that is so that I can look at my computer and not have to go and handle documents that are now 100 plus years old. Um, so you know, they're, in a, they're, they're safely secured. I wanted to do that with this book. So I started to transcribe it. And in doing so, I started to comment and make notes. And that all seems to add value into the reprint. So it's not a photocopied facsimile. It's, you, you, it's completely transcribed. You will get the footnotes that come with each section so you can read it and read the corrections and everything as you go along. And one of those major corrections warrants more than just a footnote. And that is this tale of um, a million rounds at High Wood. Uh, Rich Willis, who's a member of the association, um, and I wrote an academic paper uh, probably two years ago now, actually, that we've included as a full appendix uh, in this because that corrects that story um, by an order of magnitude. So it wasn't a million rounds, you know, by examining the war diaries and looking at some other information as well. It was actually about 90, I think it's 99,750. You know, there's a zero missing off there um, to hit a million. And, and we go through that in detail, but we provide that context in the book and where we have the, uh, the opportunity to do so, we correct, inform, um, 
yeah, uh, and provide additional value-added uh, information in those in the footnotes and in the appendices as well. People that want to understand a bit more about machine gunnery, um, machine gun companies, how they were organised, it, it's it's all in there. And we've also, because these battalion histories or these histories uh, are sometimes not indexed at all, uh, and sometimes they're badly indexed, we've done a complete index of names, places, uh, units that are mentioned as well. So it's not just for those that might be interested in the 33rd Battalion, but the uh, battal infantry battalions of the 33rd Division, or those that are alongside it, may well get a mention. As to some quite famous names in there, you know, Bernard Montgomery pops up a few of the 33rd Div race days uh, that Hutchison then goes on to talk about as well. And I think you're going for a really high quality, aren't you? Um, I think you're using the example of the Long Range Desert Group and the uh, SAS. Uh, fac well, they were facsimiles, weren't they? Their, their prints. Uh, no, so the SAS and Long Range Desert Group Roll of Honor. So it was, it's a really high quality book uh, that some people will be familiar with. And it's, you know, uh, nice fabric cover, uh, color throughout, uh, you know, high glossy quality paper. This is going to be a hardback that, because we wanted to do justice to the original as well. So it's got to sit on somebody's shelf and, and, be a nice uh, a collector's edition in a way, in the same way that the original turned into. So it, it does very much do you know, do justice to the uh, to the original, not just in content but in appearance. And one of the directors of the association, um, Matt, is a graphic designer. He he's putting all of that time into making sure that this looks absolutely brilliant, uh, and all of those watercolors are um, re repla uh, uh, you know, reproduced in the book superbly. Uh, the photos as well. But what we've also done is, because some of those watercolours are absolutely amazing, um, we've done really high quality scans of those. And just like in 1919, they are also available to purchase as prints. So uh, the edition that I've got of the book actually has in the front from, I think it's Waterloo, uh, the publishers, order your prints, which I thought was amazing. So I thought, we, you know, let's copy that. Um, we provide the posters and things that you can see behind, you know, the instructional posters uh, as prints anyway, from A3 all the way up to A0. With these, these watercolors are absolutely superb and we'll do the same. So, you know, if you've got a collection or a library and stuff and you want to, you know, add some color with some machine gun prints, then, then the, these will be available as well. Uh, and what, what price are you uh, selling it at? Uh, the book's available for £25, so we decided that, um, you know, we, we weren't going to try and take uh, take advantage of the fact that these sell for between £100 and £400 as the originals. This is a £25 book. Um, we've looked at the, the printing costs to make sure that the association gets some return for that and, and, and justifies what we're doing. Um, but at £25, I think it's a really good, I think, quick, easy buy uh, is, is that price point that people hopefully make a quick decision on. I, well, as you know, I've already put my order in, so that's fantastic. Um, you talked about some wider projects, so uh, perhaps we might move on to that before we wrap up. What, what wider projects are you talking about? Yeah, so uh, Vickers MG Collection Research Association is clearly not just about the Vickers machine gun in the Great War. Um, it's clearly not just about the machine gun corps as well. Uh, we, we've got a lot to cover between 1912 and 1968 in the British and then everybody else around the world. What we want to do is create a, a series of machine gun memoirs, um, over, you know, including this, including some Second World War examples, and we're looking to um, some unpublished material as well. So some diaries that we, we've got access to of um, some prominent machine gunners where you know, we'll have those published um, over the next few years. So you know, this this is really the start of a, of a, of a publishing journey for us, um, whereas we try and disseminate this information as much as possible. That. That all fits into, um, I say it's not just about Machine Gun Corps, uh, but it all fits into some of the work that we're doing as uh, the association now um, sort of manages the Machine Gun Corps history project as well, which was something that was set up 20 years ago. Uh, and many watchers may well be uh, familiar with some of the key individuals in that, Bob Alexander, Bill Fulton, Alan Simcock, 
David Thistlethwaite, Martin Casal, they were, they were the key authors around that. Some of those have sadly passed away, others are still working on it, but that is a five-part history of the Machine Gun Corps from 1915 to 1922. And we're going to, you know, be, we're pulling that together at the moment alongside this and uh, arranging for that to be published as well. Uh, there's still some some work to be written on that, some you know, big areas uh, to do, but I think you know, what we've done so far on understanding how the Machine Gun Corps supported um, Northwest Russia, uh, you know, India, the Mesopotamia, all of those areas that are often overlooked, Ireland as well, um, you know, key area of interest for next year. Yeah, we're, it's all going to come together in, in this five part um, history, uh, which despite Hutchison's best efforts in 1938, writing the history of the machine gun corps, then it really didn't do it justice. It was a chapter at the end of a book about machine gunnery. There's so many more tales to tell. So that's one of the main, you know, main uh, focuses of effort for us. But then uh, you know, we have this, this wider uh, activity uh, for the association focused on you know, Second World War material as well. Uh, so we've got a couple of key memoirs to, to look at there. Uh, and then maybe we'll roll on to different publishing uh, publishing things. But that will probably be after 2022, because as you put in your question, what's happening then? Uh, you know, we've mentioned 1922 a couple of times. That was the disbandment of the Machine Gun Corps and the return of machine guns to infantry battalions. So next year represents the centenary of that. And we want to commemorate not only the existence of the Machine Gun Corps, which we'll do with uh, alongside the Machine Gun Corps on Comrades Association. Uh, we've had the conversations with them about, you know, they, they are very people focused um, and have a different tack to us, uh, but they, you know, being uh, weapons focused. But, you know, we'll work together to ensure that there's a program of events next year that does justice to this core that existed for just seven years, but very much changed the tone of machine gunnery uh, to today. You know, the reason that we understand and know about sustained and indirect fire and the reason that Specialist Weapons School at, um, at Warminster you know, still teach some of these things is because of those men in the machine gun corps. The reason that we had thousands of men from specific regiments in the Second World War uh, put together trained machine gunners is because we understood what doing that meant during the Great War with the machine gun corps. So it's very much about building on that legacy. And we, we've spoke to various museums, national, regional level, uh, and, and groups and stuff that are interested. So our, our sort of three phase plan for next year is to have a na some national level uh, exposure and exhibitions, um, regional where it links in with regimental and core museums. And then hopefully, uh, you know, we want to do as they've done in um, 1995 and in 2002 for various anniversaries, is a commemorative shoot. You know, when you're commemorating machine gunners and you know, their activities, actually showing what some of this stuff does on the range is really important. So we're looking to plan that as well. Uh, and then build into it the publication of those key things like the first part of the machine gun core history, some of the additional machine gun, machine gun memoirs that we've got as well. Uh, and, and alongside that, just get machine gunnery into a conversation about the Great War. You know, I mean, you, let's say you're a battlefield guide you know how many times does it come up in conversation when you're at a stand um you're at a location again well what did the machine guns do so we want to be able to make sure that the battlefield guides have that information um are able to talk knowledgeably about it uh understand what it means and what it meant to be a machine gunner understand the influence that they can have on the battle understand how these things work as compared to lewis guns so you know sometimes lewis guns come up more so but nobody mentions the machine gun company that were 2000 yards away providing much more suppressive fire um than for the company going forward uh we want to make sure that that's all available both on a civilian and a military level and we want to make sure that we engage with the military to uh you know uh, around the world actually to ensure that they understand that legacy that machine gunnery has had and its influence on what they're doing today because as we know you know history you know is important to to learn from and if there's something that we're missing because that's happened in the past uh you know we've got examples of where people forgot about the capability of machine gunnery um and you know we want to make sure that that doesn't get forgotten again really so um it's a limited edition, as I understand it. Um, uh, you haven't yet uh, decided on how many you're going to print. Um, 
if people don't sign up for it now, Rich, are they going to be able to do it in the future or is it going to be a one-off opportunity? Uh, we we want to move on to other projects. So this is a great project to, to, to get started with. Um, and you know, this is something that we, uh, as you say, we're undecided about how many. It's going to depend on pre-orders, really. Uh, and you know, the pre-order is is open for people to use and we'll provide the links and everything. But the um, there will be some spare capacity on top of that. Um, but I, you know, I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to encourage people to get the pre-orders because then we know that people want that. Uh, if if we do decide to run a print run again, it's it's going to have to be with a minimum number, uh, which is unlikely to be achievable. I think, you know, just just looking at how this is running, um, there's there's a limited audience for it. We acknowledge that. But we do have this as the first in a series of projects that we want to get into in publishing machine gun memoirs um, from the Great War, the Second World War, uh, and outside of that as well, different kinds of things. So um, without a, a resurgence of interest at a key point, this is certainly going to go off the shelves uh, for a while, I think. So yeah, definitely encourage people to pre-order it where they can. Great. Well, we're, we're going to put a link to uh, an order form um, so people watching this can download it. Uh, but I think the message you're getting through to them is uh, if you want a copy, get your order in quickly. Um, it might be your only opportunity. Come on. So, Great. go on, Dudley. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. My apologies for the the, the quality of my sound. Um, we had to do. We had to re, uh, record this remotely. Um, and um, as we discovered early on this evening, um, they're a bit behind the times down there in that there Wiltshire. Um, and halfway through our recording, someone rang uh, Rich's front doorbell uh, and his security system clearly took the whole village's electricity <laughs> supply and it all went down. Um, and so um, that's the other thing that um, uh, the continuity issue. I started that recording with glass, without glasses. Halfway through, I appear with glasses. Um, Joseph, you seem to have lost us. Uh, I've just put in that reminder about what to do. Um, okay, we mentioned that there was an order form. So let me just share that with you now. So I'm just going to share the order form, um, which just gives a bit of background information, actually. You, you, you'll find that information on the order page anyway. Uh, so if you if you want to you know, download something, you know, the links are all there. Uh, but equally, uh, you know, the, the Links there, great. Let me just, um, I'm not sure if uh, hyperlinks work in the um, in the chat. Let's take a look and we'll just add that because I like using bit.ly links um, and it means I can remember them as well. So there we go, bit.ly uh, slash 33rd MGC uh, should get you straight to the order page as well. So yeah, both both work there. Uh, and for those that are watching this through the uh, replay, the link is in the email that is attached to the replay. So if you missed it when you clicked on the link, just go back to it and you'll see that the um, the, the order form is there attached. Okay, um, there were a couple of questions that came in during the, um, the talk. And if there are any more, please put them in the chat box. Um, I'm going to put them up on screen. And once again, for the purposes of the people who are watching the replay, you won't see these questions. So I'm going to read them out. That's not what we're taught to do at Ari's instruction, um, but it's for the benefit of the people on the relay, uh, replay. So um, Gordon, uh, sorry, uh, Richard has asked, Gordon Corrigan in Mud, Blood and Poppycock describes the Vickers indirect fire using the beaten zone. Will you please explain what this means? My, my instant reaction was to look around for a blackboard. 
Um, and I haven't got one, so I'm panicking now uh, because the best way of doing this is a little diagram. Um, but the uh, I have got a notepad. So basically, the beaten zone is you know a machine gun. Is, you know, I did try to answer this in the text, but let, but you know for the purposes of the of the vid, uh, for the purposes of the tape, that's not the first time you've heard that, is it, Dudley? Um, the uh, the yeah, beaten a machine gun is not designed to hit the same spot every time. You know, it is designed to spread. Uh, spread the shot so you know it will rattle on a tripod um you know the barrel will move it's not going to stay in the same place it's not a deadly accurate weapon um and what that results with is an elliptical shape uh where all of the ammunition will fall uh and it's into that shape that shape is called the beaten zone so it is the zone that's been beaten by fire um to expand on the on the written answer it's a case of overlapping lots of different individual guns beaten zones where you create a density of fire that is just you know it is suppressive um and that zone changes as well so you know, your beaten zone at a thousand yards isn't the same as your beaten zone at two thousand yards uh it gets quite technical that's why you have range tables um it isn't the same beaten zone depending on whether you're firing against a slope or onto a reverse slope as well so reverse slope you know extends the beaten zone forward slope shortens the beaten zone um lots of lots lots of technicalities around it which is really interesting um how do you uh, and just as a quick anecdote of how do you find out what the beaten zone is is you find a really long beach and you fire the gun at different distances and then you go and measure the beaten zone smooth out the sand measure it again um and that is how the machine gun school developed you know and understood or you know, what its beaten zones for different weapons were um an experiment that probably needs to be redone uh you know at pendine sands at some point um for the current sustained fire weapons so yeah it's uh it's an interesting one thank thanks um john has asked the question um is the use of Vickers at Vimy because of the Canadian purchase of them at home or a conscious change in doctrine? So the um, the, the Vickers at, uh, at Vimy was, you know, they, they, they originally came across Canadian Div with their Colt machine guns and their Colt potato diggers. Uh, and, you know, th those aren't great at sustained fire. They're an air-cooled weapon um, that is a pain and lumpy. Uh, so it's... It, by the time they'd expanded beyond a division, Colt guns had to be resupplied from Canada. Uh, yeah, we didn't have those in the UK. So we decided to go through GHQ, or the War Office decided that actually, I think it's, it's sort of quite late on in 1915, um, that they decided to switch from, Vickers, uh, from Colt to Vickers guns. So by the time we hit Vimy in 17, uh, yeah, the, whole, the whole core is using Vickers machine guns purely out of... Um, you know, logistical sanity. Uh, you know, Rob, Rob's on, um, you know, on, on the chat I've seen there, and, and perhaps he'll understand logistical sanity uh, a bit more than most about the Great War. But, you know, sometimes it's surprising to see it, it you know, be an element of sanity rather than insanity. Uh, but it all works out. You know, the, the Canadian Machine Gun Corps is fully Vickers equipped by the time it's formed. Uh, one thing that it does say is there are still some Colt guns knocking around. So they do brigade those, um, which must have been an interesting, probably wore them out, having been in service for a few years already. Uh, and, and then the barrage effect uh, comes in because... You know, it's something we're developing in 1915. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm pretty sure that the 358 and those that um, you know, heard me say 328 and immediately ran to connect, um, you know, check their copy of Grafton's MGs, um, will have seen that it's not 328, it's 358. So even more impressive. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the biggest concentration of Vickers machine guns um, over its history. It's probably the biggest concentration of machine guns actually on the same operation in history as well. Thank you. Um, Collins asked, hold on a second, let me put the question up. Collins asked, um, was a Vickers ever continuously fired without water? And if so, how many rounds were shot before it failed? Um, I've tried it. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it boils up after, a th uh, after 600 rounds. And even so, you know, without water, it's going to last 250 rounds. Um, 
uh, before it stops working properly. Uh, before it stops working completely to failure, it's probably 500, 600 rounds. Um, we were out firing on Saturday, uh, which is probably why I look tired in two different segments of that, um, or in one rather than the other. Uh, and we were firing without water in the jackets. We were only firing blank, and we were getting stoppages because of the expansion of the metal after 150 to 200 rounds. So we then had to leave the guns, let them cool down, and start again. Yeah, it, what what I've learned from yeah, we, we are I, I I'll say privileged because um, it probably is the right descriptor for it, but we are privileged for the association to have Section Five authorization, so we can fire these guns. Um, and yeah, those that do want to come and visit and see the guns being fired, then that's something that we're looking to set that up at the moment. Well, we've had visits before. You know, some some people here may well have um, visited the collection, uh, but we're starting to put dates back in the diary now as restrictions lift. Um, you'll see how the Vickers fires, and if you get the conditions right, you'll see how it doesn't like firing um, when the ammunition belts are too wet, and that would, that's a really you know, problematic lesson uh for the for for the machine gun corps in in the great war and it's also doesn't like it when it gets too warm so temperamental weapon you'd think the british army wouldn't have adopted one that doesn't want to work in the rain uh but that's still procurement today as well okay i said that i wanted to stop the questions at the top of the hour so we'll take the last two and then we're going to show that bonus content that i promised at the start um Richard has asked Rich, please can you talk about the different rates of fire? So I will get this wrong, um, but there are effectively four rates of fire. They are, um, so the, the, there's the cyclic rate of fire, which is how, how fast the gun operates. And that's between 450 and 600 rounds of, um, per minute. Uh, clearly, you, you, you change that by adjusting the fusey spring on the side of the gun. Um, it's quite uh, it's quite effective quite quickly and that's the big spring that sends that sends the action forward you'll see in one of the following videos but then there are four tactical rates of fire and you've got everything from slow i think it's barrage slow rapid and fast um or normal and rapid I and mean, the names change over time so uh, you've got four the basic so, so the ones that we worry about are the rapid fire which is one bout every minute so it's 250 rounds a minute, bursts of 25 rounds with about five to six seconds in between. And, you know, you do that for a minute. Uh, the normal rate of fire is two, uh, sorry, one bout every two minutes. So you just double the you'd increase, 12 seconds between. Uh, the slow rate of fire is one bout every, um, every four minutes. And then the barrage rate of fire which is where you just want those guns going for hours and that will be i think it can go as low as five minutes it can go as low as 10 minutes it's normally in the operational orders uh but it's normally about every five to eight minutes for a bout of ammunition and that's where you've got those 358 guns together where you're getting the saturation from different guns and in many cases then the water in the jacket won't even boil so you're not. So if you're firing it at the fast rate, that bo water boils up after a couple of minutes, and your gun's going to overheat. You're going to keep having to replenish the water. It becomes a nightmare to manage. If you then um, are at barrage rate, and you've got it like every you know, 25 rounds every minute, every two minutes, whatever you're doing, um, it just goes on forever and ever. It seems so. Yeah, that that's that's one of those uh, nuances of um, yeah how people expect machine guns to work. Constant fire. You don't need it if you've got constant suppression, constant effect, rather than constant input, constant action. I think that's just teased us up nicely for the last question before we go to the bonus content. It's come from Roy. Is there a time period where the Vickers needed a service? Did any parts wear out quicker than others? Well, you're going to see how quickly it takes to change a barrel um, and how quickly it takes to strip and reassemble the gun um, in the video. And that isn't, you know, it, it won't go past your bedtime. Um, it's quite a quick action. Uh, some parts just break quite quickly. The items that wear are the barrel um, and uh, and the muzzle, muzzle cups and muzzle discs because they get, um, you know, jammed up with... with, with yeah, you get coked up quite badly. 
uh, some of some bits are disposed. That's probably the only disposable bit on a two disposable bits on the gun, actually. Um, the barrel uh, and and that muzzle disc. And that's about you want to change the barrel about every 10,000 rounds. Check it and stick it back in again if it's still good. So you gauge it. Uh, and then that should last between 18 and 25,000 rounds. So that's the bit that wears out. Other parts on the gun will just keep going and going and going until they break. Great. Look, I think I'm just in awe of Rich's knowledge. I really am. Um, we've, we've been talking for hours between us, and there's so much he knows. Uh, and um, his answers to your questions without any preparation, I just think is, is tremendous. Um, and this book is really worth buying. I, I know that. I've seen the original. I want a copy on my shelf um of the uh of the reprint um now what we're going to do now is we're going to play that bonus content um and um then we will rich and i will come back uh, and rich will take any questions um from anyone that's still around um and clearly that's a chance for you to to thank him for uh, uh what he's done for us this evening but let's just have a look at that, that bonus content. So if we take our cameras uh, off for the moment, yep. which we will come back. So here's a quick sort of overview of, uh, of the main characteristics of the Vickers machine gun. This is one of the earliest guns in the collection, L311, made in November 1914. And you can see that it's got this fluted barrel casing. That's what made it lighter. Uh, and it weighs a, between 35 and 40 pounds, uh, or 32, 33 pounds, something like that, um, for the gun. And then the tripod's nearly 50 pounds. It, the, the reason there's that variance is because the gun has uh, different types of um, lightning added, you know, the different bits of milling away to make it uh, lighter. but obviously that takes a lot longer to produce. So as the war goes on, as the Great War sort of progresses, you see much of this finishing disappear, but the gun gets heavier as a result. And the guns at the end of the Great War are about seven to nine pounds heavier than they were at the start. It makes quite a difference. Um, but it is uh, water-cooled, so the, this barrel casing holds seven pints of water that when firing at a rapid rate, they boil after 600 rounds, and you lose about a pint and a half for every thousand rounds fired. Uh, you have to, there's no pump system or vacuum system, you have to manually fill the water in through the, this uh, top plug here. And you can either drain it if you're not firing, or against this um, here, you attach a hose, and that will, it, so that bit comes off, that's currently there to protect the thread from damage as you're moving the gun around. The, this hose would then screw on, like so, and the end of that hose goes into a bag, so that a soaked bag, so that the steam doesn't give your permission, uh, position away. It's not uh, designed to be able to uh, reuse water at this point. That's when you replace it with a petrol tin, two gallon can, uh, that would eventually become standard in, in British service. Uh, the, the end of the tube would go in below a uh, level of water in the can, and that would stop the steam, begin, uh, steam giving your position away, but also mean that you can reuse that water as well. Uh, it, you need a number of people to be able to use the Vickers. Uh, the number one, who is the firer, uh, they carry the tripod. They're the person that decides where you sit uh, with that gun, and they get it level. And then the number two, carrying the gun, comes along and puts the gun on top. The number three uh, in the team, and this is a Great War team that we're talking about, uh, comes along and brings the ammunition boxes. Now, each ammunition box carries 250 rounds in, in a bout like this. And that, oh, um, that weighs about 22 pounds. So two, box, uh, two boxes of ammunition weighs as much as the tripod, uh, just a little bit more than the gun. Obviously, when the gun's got the water in, it's that little bit heavier as well. So yeah, two boxes equals a tripod or a gun. So not any one person can carry all of these different components. And if you think that you can get through that box of ammunition in about two minutes, you need to keep uh, a rapid rate, you, you know, about one minute, um, in, in the quick rate, 
uh, you need to carry ammunition forward as much as possible. So you, know, you have these uh, number four, number five, number six, number seven, and number eight in a machine gun detachment in the Great War. Uh, they have their other duties as well. So they operate as a scout, the range taker, um, the number four will... So number three will bring the ammunition to the gun. The number four will make sure that the number three has ammunition boxes and spare parts that they're needed as well. Um, but, and, and if all of those people are working together, they can make sure that this gun remains in action uh, for as long as possible. The only things that will damage a gun and put it out of action are uh, damage to the barrel casing uh, here and damage to the breech casing there. Uh, everything else is replaceable in the field using the spare parts. So um, you, know, you get that gun into position in, in relatively few seconds uh, if you need to use it in an emergency, uh, but it, it doesn't necessarily operate like a normal uh, weapon would, uh, you know, normal rifle or, or, or Lewis gun, for example. Uh, you have to cock it twice uh, to, to, to get the ammunition from here in the belt down into uh, the barrel, which sits below it. So you have to cock that twice. Uh, it, the, all I'm saying there is really that it takes some sort of technical expertise to know how to use the Vickers. You can lay it um, up to 2,800 yards with the Mark 7 ammunition, effective range at about 2,000 yards. Uh, you, know, you get it dug in, get it in an emplacement, a little bit, perhaps second or third line uh, emplacement, and you'll you know, be able to dominate the battlefield with it quite easily. So what I'm going to do now is just uh, quickly run through the stripping and reassembling of the Vickers for you. You can see how easy it is. Um, but what I'm going to do first is change the gun, because this is one of our deactivated guns in the collection. Uh, but to show you the stripping and reassembling, I need to use one of the firing guns that we have. And this is one of the latest uh, production Vickers machine guns. Uh, so an Australian example made in the Second World War. You can see that... If they still fit on the tripods, the Mark IV tripods used from the Maxim all the way through to the end of the Vickers surface life. Uh, to disassemble it or to strip it down, we have to take the lockout first. So that's the main central mechanism of the gun. Uh, we then move to the front and take the muzzle attachment off. So just a twist there. And then the muzzle cup that's on the end of the barrel has to come round. That's what all the recoil force goes against, so those get really mucky, um, even just from blank firing. Uh, we're then going to take off the fusey spring that's on the left-hand side of the gun. That's the sort of big main spring that fires the action forward again uh, once it's come to the rear. Sh shut the back cover, open the front cover, take out the feed block, drop the front cover, open the back cover, and take off the rear cross piece. So there's a T-fixing pin there, cross piece drops like that. We then have these two small plates, uh, left and right, that come off. And then once we've done that, the whole barrel, you can see quite easily, the whole barrel comes out uh, like so. You can then clean it, check it, make sure that there's no surface wear, no uh, surface rust. You can also gauge it to make sure that it's still suitable for use. So a barrel life runs anywhere between 10 and 18 to 25,000 rounds. Uh, depending on how fast it's been firing, how hot it's got, what the wear levels are, etc, etc, quality of the ammunition as well. Uh, so once you've checked that, you can just put it back in uh, from the rear of the gun. So it all has to be done from the rear, but you do need to be able to get to the front uh, to be able to take that muzzle attachment off. So you put that back in, you then put the right hand side piece in and the left. Like so took the rear cross piece back up, put that T-fixing pin in, drop the top cover, open the front cover, replace the feed block, close the front cover, open the top cover, uh, let's put the fusey spring back in, so that has to be put in the right way up, that's all the mechanism, as I said, that fires, the gut, fires all the mechanism forward again, that's put on there, then we turn it back round, we're going to replace the muzzle cap, we can do that, replace the muzzle attachment, like so. There is a combination tool that helps you do that if, if it's not hand tight. And then replace the lock. Make sure that's all in place and down, and then we can fire the action, like so.
Rich, wait for you. Right. Brilliant. I'm here. So, um, I promised you that we try not to go much beyond the hour, and those that wanted to stay to see that bonus content, that's great. Um, we had at the peak this evening 90 people in the room, Rich. Um, and I appreciate that. We thought 35 people um, needed to be convinced that they ought to buy this book. I think quite a few were. Um, are there any more questions? Um, if not, we will finish in a few minutes. But we, we, we've got time if people want them. Uh, and if you want to show Rich a, a, a round of applause and just use those emojis in the chat box. Um, but Rich, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Susie, can you come and fire the Vickers? Um, no, uh, quite simply. Um, I know that's offensive, isn't it? Um, I don't know you. You might be able to. Uh, it would be um, okay. it, it would be subject to Wiltshire Police being very, very happy. Uh, we, we do have people come here quite a lot and see the Vickers being fired, um, but there are so many restrictions around it, actually, um, that only our servants, which makes me sound really posh, doesn't it? Um, there's a t there's a term in law called a firearms dealer's servant, and they don't make me tea, but they do come and fire the guns. Uh, you are welcome to come down and see them being fired. If we can ever square something away with the Ministry of Defence to get some firing on their land again and under their auspices, um, then we'll publish it far and wide, and that will mean other people can come and fire it because they're allowed to do such things, but we aren't. Um, yeah, it I, I, I ought to jump in there, Rich. Susie's a highly qualified army trainer. That's absolutely recently. Well, she can help out then. Um, she can she can get in touch with us, um, and we can square some away. Find a range control officer. Find a Remi technical officer that will sign off the guns, which is what we're trying to go through at the moment for Bisley for next year. So, so I alluded to twenty twenty two in the uh, in in the messages and uh, sorry in the in the video, um, and you know we would. Uh, we're trying to pin something away so um yeah it's uh it, there's plans in place okay there a couple of questions have come in chris smith has asked how does the vicar's light differ from the maxim uh the simple answer is it's upside down uh so what they did was they inverted the toggle action uh that sits in the breech casing here um it's a little bit more technical than that because of the wet because it means you've got to have an open um open breech casing in the bottom so dust and everything kicks up uh but it's upside down it's made from much lighter materials so vickers did not invent the machine gun um, that then bore their name and probably made them more famous uh, than many other things. They are a steel manufacturing company uh, that then does good things with artillery, naval pieces, and they may they use their expertise in steel manufacturing to create this lightened um, lightened barrel casing, to create a stronger breech casing, uh, springs, and everything that sit within it. So it's about twenty pounds lighter, um, and it's worth saying that the two guns behind me here are say l311 which i talked about in the video um which if uh steve was watching and saw me dis disassemble the gun he probably thought what i was about to do with it but i did swap guns and then this one up here i can't move my hand in the right way because it's um it, it's all mirrored uh but this one here is a very late series l series gun and is about five pound heavier um than than this gun here because of the changes in manufacturing so the maxim to the light vickers gets significantly lighter and then it gets heavier again over the course of the war because we want to make more quickly okay i think probably the last question then comes from elaine and i don't know where pinning ranges are or pilning ranges are but do pilning ranges still allow firing of antique weapons quite possibly i don't know um but these aren't antiques so in the eyes of the law uh, these are not antique um weapons although they certainly feel it sometimes um and you know it's uh from a parts perspective and things like that it certainly uh feels like they should be antique but that but they're certainly not um so these aren't something that you can rock up to a range in the uk and fire um very easily yeah i did ask you privately about the supply of ammunition yeah. and the cost do you want to mention that yeah i mean it, it 
yeah, just as an understanding of how, you know, if, if there are shooters um, watching that perhaps take their uh, SMLEs out, firing 303 ounce ammunition, um, they'll understand this. But yeah, we, we're now sort of working upwards of a, a, a pound a round, basically. So you know, we, we did some documentary work last Saturday, firing Second World War machine, uh, Second World War Vickers and doing something for that. And just to do blank firing, um, yeah, we, we put nearly a thousand rounds worth of ammunition through in, in, in a few hours in the rain. So and it wasn't really working that well. So you know, from an association perspective where we're trying to share what the Vickers machine gun does, um, understanding this is, is, is quite difficult now because we don't use from a safety perspective, um, we don't use surplus ammunition. Uh, so yeah, the, all, the last 303 that was made on mass was 1981. Um, and we now have to buy new made ammunition uh, you know, that is made in Serbia. Um, and yeah, get, it can get quite expensive. Great. Okay. Rich, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw stumps. Yep. Um, that's a cricketing term for people that don't follow cricket. Um, just a reminder uh, that if you were late arriving this evening or if you had connection problems and were in and out, Everybody who uh, signed up for this session, whether they attended or not, will automatically get a copy of the recording. Um, that's going to be rendered as soon as I end the session, and it should be in your email boxes overnight and certainly by the morning. So thank you all for joining us. Um, if you enjoyed it, a public way of thanking uh, Rich is to mention him on Twitter. Uh, that's at uh, VickersMG or at Battle Guide, that's me. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll get another speaker of this quality on again. However, which is going to be a really hard act to follow. And before he blushes too much, I'm going to end the session. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks for coming.